Morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out this morning. I also want to thank people for being here because uh, events like this can be really quite dry. <laughs> so to see a group of people here uh, to attend a conference on evidence-based policy, it means that you are uh, all very, very committed to this cause. Um, and I think it's very important that you're committed. Uh, there are a whole host of influences on public policy, and I spent 20 years in Congress working on such things. I think one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, influence on policy matters is evidence. Evidence for or against a proposition. Um, a lot of people are skeptical of that these days. That skepticism isn't unwarranted, but I would again caution against being too much of a cynic. People see these massive, partisan, polarizing, ideological fights, and they basically get the sense that nothing can happen, nothing can move, nothing can get done. Uh, ideology is not a bad thing. It's not a dirty word. It's a way to, you know, order the world into a coherent philosophy. I consider myself an ideologue. But when you take your gaze away from the larger political fights of the day, you end up working on very discreet, very important policy issues that affect a huge number of people. Even in ideological polarizing times, so many good things that can make a huge difference in people's lives actually can get done. And I think that this is very, very important. There are massive areas of policy that were changed because there was almost overwhelming evidence around a policy change. One of my favorite pieces of this evidence is the welfare reform of 1996. Welfare reform in 1996 didn't happen because Bill Clinton was a moderate and Newt Gingrich forced him to act. Welfare reform in 1996 happened because there was an overwhelming amount of evidence that a work-first approach was the most effective way for improving the lives of those on the old AFDC program. Beginning in the 1980s, with the national evaluation of welfare-to-work strategies and the passage of the Family Support Act, then broad-based waiver authority in states were proving that there was strong evidence of a work-first strategy. Incidentally, this is why I'm confident that ideas such as a universal basic income will never ever actually pass into law. We've studied this. Large scale pilot projects in Seattle and Denver, Gary, Indiana and Rochester all proved and provided that a version of UBI and we saw significant effects on work. It didn't help move people to work. So what does this mean for current policy making? Well, when I was speaker, I can discuss a number of reforms that we passed in law in large part because of the evidence that was at the core to the legislation on the policies we were considering. We got so many things done because we had overwhelming evidence and we did these things in yes, polarizing times on big bipartisan votes. Criminal justice reform is a perfect example. Huge momentum for criminal justice reform existed because state-based reforms provided an incredible evidence base that one could reform our justice system while ensuring the safety of our citizens. Family first. The massive rewrite of our federal foster care program happened entirely because of state waiver authority showing that prevention was a huge benefit to at-risk youth. At youth. Pay for success. With the passage of Social Impact Partnership to Pay for Success Act, we provided funding for states to partner with the federal government to identify key metrics for social programs and make payments when results are delivered. What a novel concept. One of my favorite programs is MCV, Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Visitation Program. This program was created under the Bush administration. It was codified under the Obama administration in the Affordable Care Act, and then it was reauthorized under President Trump. Finally, the passage of the Evidence Act, which is what we're here to talk about today, has been key to pushing the federal government into a more proactive stance in developing evaluation capabilities, improving data capabilities, and ensuring that data collected by the government remains secure. I could go on and on and on, but from areas as varied as education, to healthcare, to criminal justice, to child welfare, evidence played a key role in policy development and enactment. While the media concentrates on the political day to day, Policymakers continue to pursue policy reforms that will improve the lives of millions of people into the future. So what is the future use of evidence in policy? Can we bank more reforms and more successes on an evidence basis and a 
in a bipartisan way in this hyperpolarizing time. That's what we'll be discussing. A large part of this will be answered by looking to the future implementation of this Evidence Act. We've given the federal government tools to appropriately evaluate the worth of federal programs that are being funded. What does the federal government need to do to properly implement the Evidence Act? How will local governments and nonprofits react? We look forward to our distinguished panel to discuss these and other questions. I'm excited about this field because I do really believe that you will finally be able to ally and ally private nonprofits, local state governments, federal efforts in a bipartisan way to truly measure success based on what actually works. We have a distinguished panel in front of us, Ron Haskins. Ron Haskins is a senior fellow and holds the Cabot Family Chair in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution, where he co-directs the Center for Children and Families. He is formerly a senior consultant at the Annie Casey Foundation and was the president of the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management in 2016. He previously co-chaired the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission, and I was grateful that he accepted my appointment. Beginning in 1986, he spent 14 years on the staff of the most important and the best committee in the House of Representatives, the House Ways and Means Committee. And he was subsequently appointed to be the senior advisor to President Bush on welfare policy. He and his colleague, Bell Sawhill, were awarded the 2016 Monaghan Prize by the American Academy of Political and Social Science for being champions of the public good and advocates for public policy based on social science research. He is a pioneer in his field. Nick Hart. Nick Hart is the chief executive officer of the Data Coalition, which will be playing an incredibly important role in the future in this endeavor. He helped to craft the Milestone Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, including the Open Government Data Act. And he has worked with numerous federal agencies and congressional committees to design effective data, evaluation, and privacy policies over the past decade. Jim Sullivan. Professor Jim Sullivan is the Gilbert F. Schaefer College Professor of Economics at Notre Dame. Go Irish. He has been a visiting scholar at the National Poverty Center and a visiting professor at the University of Chicago at the Harris School. His research examines the consumption, saving, and borrowing behavior of poor households and how welfare and tax policy affects the well-being of the poor. In 2012, with the fellow Notre Dame professor, Bill Evans, Professor Sullivan founded the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, of which I am serve on the board, and I'm also um, a co-professor Notre, at Notre Dame in the same department. Uh, these, these three gentlemen will come up um, and answer some profound questions on the future of policy and evidence where I think we're going to make a big difference. Will you three please come join me up here? <clears throat> Let's see. Good morning, guys. Morning. Good morning. This is cool. I usually get to be the one to ask, ask, <laughs> being asked, asked these questions. They actually have the chance to be the interviewer. It's actually kind of a fun thing for me. Um, here's what I want to start off with a few questions and ask if, each of you to comment on this. Um, how do you see the evaluation officers? Well, yeah, let me start with this. How do you see the evaluation officers and learning agendas changing and the culture of agencies around uh, working toward these results? So how do you see the federal government actually changing as this law is getting implemented? And how can Congress, and what more can Congress do to support the Evidence Act? So let me just ask you that first off. Um, and I want to get into some agencies like Department of Labor and the rest. Ron, why don't we start with you? Um, I think that many of the departments are already moving in that direction. <clears throat> many departments like HHS and Department of Labor, <clears throat> um, several health agencies already had a long tradition of evaluation. Uh, and they've been stimulated even more. They're doing more evaluation. They've been given more funds in many cases by Congress. In fact, one of the, if you were going to go through and pick out the 10 signs of evidence-based policy, I think one of the things you'd look for is the number of laws that have set aside funds for evaluation and required evaluation of the program, because that, that has really gotten hold. And we're going to have more and more evaluations, high quality, random assignment, other mm. good evaluations. Uh, so I think it's definitely moving in the right direction, and the agencies are supporting it. They're hiring new people that are knowledgeable about evaluation, the chief evaluation officers, but many others as well. Uh, so I think on evaluation, we're definitely moving in the right direction. Now all we have to do is figure out 
how to invent programs that actually produce impacts. So, right. so Nick, I, evaluation officers is a brand new uh, position created by this law. I'm curious to see if, if this is being implemented well, if we're getting the right people with the right training, or is this just sort of a bureaucracy box checker, or is it actually a sincere effort that's occurring within the, the, the whole federal government run through OMB? What's your take on that? Well, I think the evaluation officers is one of the most important parts of the law. So we have to have good leaders inside government agencies mm -hmm. to actually advocate for all of this work to happen. And if we're just collecting data and managing data, the data itself don't tell us anything. Right. We need the processes to actually analyze it well. And that's really the job of these evaluation officers. You asked about the learning agendas. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be instrumental in guiding the work that the evaluation officers are doing for years to come. So how is that going inside agencies today? Well, it's kind of a mix. There are some agencies that have moved very fast to identify new evaluation officers, set up uh, units and processes. Uh, there are other agencies that are maybe moving a little bit slower. Um, I like to pick on the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. uh, they have not yet named their evaluation officer. And it's actually an agency that two times in its past has had a central evaluation function, but eliminated it. So if the goal of the Evidence Act is to really establish this evaluation function across the agencies, we have a lot of work to do. It's not going to happen overnight. Nobody ever expected that. But for most agencies, we seem to be making some pretty good progress. Jim, uh, just for, for background, uh, this law came from um, originally a conversation that you and I had a number of years ago. Uh, I recall uh, just talking with you when I was when I, when I visited Notre Dame. I'm, I'd like to go on Fridays before Saturday home games <laughs> so I can stick around for the next day. Uh, but you and I were talking about um, a study on upward mobility that uh, Professor Raj Chetty had, had, had gotten this sort of unprecedented access to. He sort of kind of stumbled into it, if I, you know, I'm basically summarizing it. And I remember you and I were talking about what if other academics could get this kind of access to all of this kind of data, mm -hmm. think of the good we could do to really measure things. There ought to be a commission. You, you're the one who gave us this. There ought to be a commission to figure out how to do all of this. And then, and then we asked Ron to stand this thing up. Um, take us in your mind's eye where we are now versus where we were back when, when, when professors in universities were hoping that they could one day get access to this kind of information. Um, and then give me a, a take on why you thought that because of what you've been doing at LEO. How LEO has been working with private charities like Catholic Charities to actually um, make, bring evidence in RCTs to making them work better. So try and bring the two if you could. Yeah, I, uh, so at LEO we partner with local nonprofits to measure the impact of their domestic anti-poverty programs. And in our very first conversation, which was about six years ago, um, you asked me, you know, what can we do to help, right? How can the federal government help you do on the grounds work with, with yeah, most service providers? Most people give me a weird answer and, to that And question. I didn't know <laughs> that you were going to ask that question, yeah. so I kind of came up with something on the, on the fly. But, but what it was was, the, what was really the barrier that I saw was a problem. And, and that is that most of the outcomes that we, the key outcomes we care about when we think about anti-poverty programs, we care about uh, promoting employment. We care about you know, avoiding the, you know, the criminal justice system, staying out of the hospitals, you know, uh, reducing dependence on government programs. All of those things would be the kinds of things we'd want to measure. All of those things are measured in administrative data. And it was very rare for social service providers to ever rely on those data, you be able to, to take advantage of those data to measure the impact of those programs. So what I said to you was, it would be great to have greater access to, to, to those programs. And, uh, and, and, and the Evidence Act is really a good example of, of kind of launching a sea change here, where we're, we're just seeing more and more access to these kinds of data, which is allowing us to answer critical questions. So an example would be um, the unemployment insurance system collects earnings and employment data for every worker in the covered sector. And so we have data on who's working and who's not working and the earnings that they have. And so if you're running a job training program and you want to answer the question, is my job training program actually increasing earnings? Mm. Is it actually increasing employment? We have the data to answer that question. And right now, um, we're increasingly seeing the ability of researchers and providers to get access to those data, but it's at the state level. right? So each, each state oper operates their, their own uh, unemployment insurance system, and, uh, and there's some 
aggregation at the federal level, but the federal government could really play a key role in helping the states, states to, to share these data. And that's where the Evidence Act, I think, has, has tremendous promises, helping to create greater access to, to these kinds of data that will allow us to answer critical questions. Nick, I think you're the one I want to ask this. Um, OMB recently signaled that they may be looking at piloting a program similar to the Commission's recommendation on the National Secure Data Service. Um, how, where, where, where do you see this evolving? And have practitioners and academics found it easier to access data? This is based off of Jim's points uh, for evaluating program. Where are we uh, in the academia and getting the access? And where do you think OMB is going to be heading on this? So important to note, we're only one year post-enactment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the big sea changes that we're projecting for the future haven't all materialized yet. Uh, probably the headline recommendation out of the commission was to create this national secure data service. It was envisioned as a privacy protective environment right. for doing data linkages, but also enabling data access in a way that we've never really had inside the federal government. Um, it doesn't exist today. Uh, but there were some tea leaves included in the Evidence Act that suggested there was this interest in figuring out how to keep moving it forward. Uh, for example, there was an advisory committee on data for evidence building that was uh, linked specifically to the data service. The commission had recommended this kind of committee exist as a way of advising and being transparent and holding this organization accountable through all of the work that it does. It benefits privacy. Um, the administration in last year's budget proposal suggested something that looked a lot like a data service yeah. on a really small scale. Right. Um, so they'd proposed some funding at the Department of Commerce to basically get this started. Uh, the House of Representatives included it in the appropriations marks, but it unfortunately didn't survive the final <coughs> approach discussions. But the fact that there was a lot of progress uh, in the political dialogue and the administrative agencies really starting to figure this out, it's a really good sign that the data service is going to be a conversation we'll be continuing to push forward, and hopefully we'll see it come to fruition fairly soon. OK, let's extrapolate on that point more. Uh, Ron, um, the commission's recommendations were not all put into the Evidence Act. We I, it was a bill I did with Patty Murray. You can't always get everything in the bill you want because you had to make you know, compromises to get a, a piece of legislation over the finish line. Uh, we got much of the, of, of the uh, com commission's recommendations and uh, what didn't we do and what should we do uh, going forward based upon the commission's um, um, findings. So we got 11 of the 22 recommendations <clears throat> enacted into law, uh, which I think many people consider to be a minor miracle mm -hmm. uh, because they actually got something done in Congress. Yeah. And bang, quickly. I mean, it was, it yeah, was I had fast. To talk, I had to talk a couple senators off of their holds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very the senator, in the, lame duck. the House yeah. was really, I think it's because you're a speaker, but the House cooperated from the beginning. There were no major obstacles. Yeah, we have a thing called the Rules Committee. It's really efficient. It <laughs> works pretty well. Yeah. But even the Committee yeah. of Jurisdiction, yeah. they had a hearing. And I think almost every member showed up at one time or another. The hearing lasted about two and a half hours. And they asked a ton of questions, and they supported it. I think they reported it out of committee with no dissenting votes. Uh, it came to the House floor, was approved unanimously on the House floor. In the Senate, though, I don't know what you make of inaction, but they didn't do anything. It does. Uh, now that's a very this is the very sentence unusual we use thing. almost all of the time when we talk about the yeah, house guy, yeah, like a trash yeah. talk. The Senate. So the Senate easy. didn't do anything. Oh my God, what a surprise! Uh, <laughs> but eventually they went along, and they uh, I think they voice vote uh, on approval, uh, and the House had already voted and, and approved it, and it passed. So eleven of twenty-two. Uh, there are several on there that did not pass, and I'd like to return to the one the data service. Yeah. Um, the data service, so those of you in the audience will understand, the idea is to put data, have the capacity for states and researchers to be able to put a data set together that includes data from all kinds of programs and build one data set so that you can analyze it from all these various programs. Uh, which would be an enormous. Across reading. different agencies, across different programs. Absolutely, yes, yeah. yes. So. You want to know the outcome of a program, you could have something from food stamps, from Medicaid, from TANF, to the cash welfare program, and so forth. Uh, and there's a lot of support for that in the research committee, I mean, in the research community. And a, a fair amount of support among the states, even though I know that there'll be certain states that if we try to get their data, like mm -hmm. unemployment insurance data, which has been a notorious problem over the years, it would still be a problem. And don't forget, there is a substantial lobby out there 
that does not like sharing data. They think privacy is more important than anything else that happens. I mean, we, we met several of these on our commission. They came and testified for the commission. Um, one uh, impressive guy, he was very impressive uh, in, in testifying. He has a fairly big organization, and he testified before the committee that we shouldn't even collect the data, mm -hmm. let alone put it together and make it available to those researchers who are going to publish it and let everybody know what's going on you know, with all kinds of private families. So I think the data services, to me, that is the, it was the most important recommendation from the commission. Uh, and it, it, I think that the House and Senate wisely dropped it. Uh, and I think it's going to be very, very difficult to get it. The other things I don't think are nearly as major. We got major things already. We got the, you know, we got the, uh, a lot of uh, provisions on evaluation. Got a lot of provisions on the federal agencies. We opened the door for lots of action by the state. So we already did a lot, and we should be very happy about that. There's more we can do, but I think uh, the data service is going to have to wait a, a decade or more if we ever get it. Okay, I'm looking optimistic. Ahead. Go ahead. I hope it's Nick. not a decade. Yeah, as I said, uh, a decade seems kind of long, but uh, <laughs> explain why. I remember uh, reading that testimony. Explain why. Uh, people are so worried about this. Why, you know, they can envision some sort of Orwellian, you know, invasion of privacy um, versus the efficacy of data and, 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 and evidence and making programs work better. Just give us a quick flash of that debate and how those legitimate concerns can be sufficiently addressed. Well, so there's always been this uh, tension in conversations around data, around, you know, this belief that government is magically able to link together and uh, has this, uh, use, use the term Orwellian, mm -hmm. this uh, massive database that tracks every American citizen. Uh, I think those of us that work with data know mm -hmm. that we are so far from the possibility of that existing that the risk is pretty low. Yeah. Um, this whole design of the data service was in fact around ensuring that we're protecting privacy as we're actually using data. And so it's this secure environment where if you have to have a personally identifiable data set that you could do a data linkage, but then wipe all of the personal information, right. Right. even from a researcher that's accessing it in some secure way. Emphasize and, that a little bit more. Uh, How is that done? That's, that's the key point. I, I had to make that point to a lot of people in Congress who worried that even the compromise we had uh, were, were going to go into this area and lead to this. Well, so... Uh, it's a concept called de-identification. Uh, the federal statistical system has been doing this for decades. Uh, they call it disclosure avoidance uh, as a separate term. Uh, it's basically how the Census Bureau collects data on the entire American public and produces summary statistics that tell us about the economy and the population, but without disclosing the identity of Nick Hart and any individual data release. Right. We have very sophisticated methods and approaches for doing this in practice. Um, the Evidence Act really bolsters that entire infrastructure. Uh, Title III is a law called the Confidential Information Protection and Statistical right. Efficiency Act, or SIPSI. Uh, I describe it as... You know, it gets pretty... Uh -huh. It took them yeah, a year to remember it. had to go into the 21st century. We were, we, were, we were operating on old laws that weren't even doing a sufficient job of actually protecting privacy. So we can That's do right. both, correct? We can That's do both. Right. We can, we can update our laws to actually protect privacy and get ourselves better data so we can spend taxpayer dollars more wisely, right? So that's exactly right. I, I think about SIPSI as one of the strongest privacy laws in the world that also lets us use data. Right. So for the federal agencies that are using this legal authority, they now have new abilities to share and link data within a really strong privacy protective environment. And there's, there are civil and criminal penalties associated with violations. So this is not a joke. I mean, there are really uh, um, serious ways that we approach using this legal authority, and it's why we don't hear about data leaks and breaches mm -hmm. and identification risks coming out of these agencies. So the, the heart of the commission's mm -hmm. report is suggesting that we can improve data protections and data privacy while also improving data access. And I, I think, uh, Ron, I've heard you say the commission report uses the term privacy like 400 times. Yeah. That wasn't yeah. an accident, right? Uh, the commission was trying to be very thoughtful about how we get the most value out of these data sources that government's already collecting and actually use it for good. So we're understanding the impacts of programs and trying to better uh, take the outcomes that we know and want to improve across society and design policies that do that. One of the things that I, I should comment on as an end user of the data yeah. that has to you know, satisfy all the data security pro uh, protocols, 
Um, first, commend the commission on paying such close attention to data security, because ultimately that, that could set us back, right? If there, if there are these violations of data security, you know, we're, we're going to be uh, set back further than, than we were when we started this. Um, but there, there is a bit of a misunderstanding, I think, in general. People say, oh, you know, Raj Chetty linked IRS tax yeah. data to individuals, and he can talk about the incomes of people at the neighborhood level. Um, if you've ever been into a federal statistical uh, research data center that uh, the census has all over, all over the country, where you can actually link census data to, to other data at the micro level, um, you, you would be much less concerned about this. So mm -hmm. uh, I'll be dating myself a little bit, but it reminds me of this, this uh, spoof detective show called Get Smart, where you, when you walked in. Okay, wait, this is, who, who this all? Is, is, you guys <laughs> okay. know Get Tone Smart? Of silence, right? you know, so the start everybody. of every show, he would walk yeah. in and these yeah. steel doors yeah. would close, and then, then another steel door would open, and then yeah. those steel doors would close. And to get into a, a census research data center and get access to data where, where the first, the data is linked, but you never get access to the, the personal identifying information. You have to get fingerprinted, uh, background check. You go in, uh, you, have, you have the programs, you run the programs. You can't walk, you, anything you walk out with, they have to, they scrutinize and make sure that there's no information uh, at an individual level. So it's virtually impossible mm -hmm. for, for a researcher in that setting to be able to get access to any kind of information that, that would viol violate security. Um, and yet there's all these benefits that, that, that these kinds of uh, collaborations create. So let's, let's go into that. That's what I wanted to ask you next, which is walk us through um, some of already, uh, of some things you've achieved through success, some successes you've achieved. I remember um, I spent a number of years kind of running around the country looking at different sort of poverty alleviation models. And I became sort of enamored mm -hmm. with the Catholic charity model, with, with wraparound services mm -hmm. and how that worked. And uh, we have a pretty good one in Racine. There's a great one in Fort Worth, which Heather Reynolds ran. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I sort of got acquainted with Leo mm -hmm. because you were doing random clinical trials um, with these, these, these programs to actually prove their worth and effectiveness. So just give us a flavor of what you've already done with evidence um, that was using sort of the private data that you were able to achieve and get through for people just volunteering their information. So what have you done? And then when I ask you all, what's the next, what's the next big breakthrough that we're gonna get with evidence? Yeah, so I, I think probably the, the biggest breakthrough that we've made at Leo is helping nonprofit human service providers understand that they can actually rigorously measure the impacts of their programs and that information can help them do a better job of achieving their mission, which is moving, typically it's moving individuals out of poverty, moving into self-sufficiency, if they are armed with that evidence. And name, so, name, to give, name. so as, as an example, um, you know, one area where we see a lot of promise is in these more comprehensive approaches. So the, it tends to be the, the way we address uh, poverty alleviation in this country is uh, you know, if you're poor, we support you with food subsidies. If you're, if you don't have housing stability, we give you housing subsidies. Um, there, each problem has its own own band-aid to put on, this, uh, on the problem. Uh, but there rarely is this uh, opportunity to take a step back and say, well, why why are you homeless or not mm -hmm. housing stable? Why why are you having trouble putting food on the table? And so a more comprehensive approach that says, okay, let's first diagnose what the underlying cause is. And then let's try and treat those underlying causes. So these, uh, those kinds of services tend to be um, much more intensive in, in, in the one-on-one -on -one interaction. They are not um, cookie cutter. Uh, they're more customized to the individual. So if the individual uh, is not self-sufficient because they don't have the skills to earn, earn a, a living wage in the market, uh, well, let's get those skills and help them, help them get those skills. So that kind of more intensive intervention is more expensive. Uh, so therefore harder to implement and launch. Uh, but it also has this promise of, of I improving outcomes much more. So, so. But, that's, but, but you, you, you said it's customized. So how yes. can you sort of build a scalable model that can be replicated? Because if it's so customized, how, what can you do through evidence to actually make something mm -hmm. that is actually scalable and that you can replicate and, 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 and produce all over the country? Right, and, and the one point to make there is that it's never gonna get replicated if you can't show that it's working. Because others uh, in other communities will say, well, that sounds good, but, but it's too expensive. Yeah. If, we're, if we're spending $10,000 per person to get them out of poverty, then, then we, we won't be able to get the resources to do it. Um, so you need to show that it actually is increasing earnings and employment. You need to show that it's actually uh, saving 
the community in other ways, whether it's reduced use of social services or less likely to be in the criminal mm -hmm. justice system. And, uh, and so what we've done is say, okay, well, we're going to work with you to build that evidence. So we've worked with, with local nonprofits and said, we're, we'll, we'll build an evaluation to measure the impact of an intensive intervention on employment and earnings six months a year later, on uh, their use of government programs, you know, on um, housing stability, and other key outcomes. And the evidence we're getting from that is showing that, it's, that we're having greater effects on employment and earnings than the typical job training mm -hmm. programs. And the, together with social savings on the social safety net, these programs, uh, you can make the argument on a, co on a cost benefit basis. As a result of that, we're, we're seeing it resonate in other communities. Communities are saying, that we can do, uh, because you've shown us that it works and that it can actually save money to the community. Okay, so, so it also is, is sort of proof in the concept that you can merge the public sector with the private sector with the mm -hmm. philanthropy sector, right? There, there, there's, isn't there now a new era of stitching together government benefits, philanthropy you know, benefits with private for-profit mm -hmm. um, involvement? It, that, my fear in all of this over the past was we sort of gave the American people this impression, um, the war on poverty is here and this is government's responsibility. You don't really have to, don't worry about it. Pay your taxes, government will fix this problem. We ended up sort of segregating the poor. Mm -hmm. So now with evidence, do we not now have a new opportunity to, to reintegrate the whole idea of fighting poverty, doing it more effectively, doing it more root causes, and then measuring it based on outcomes and evidence? Does that, this give us a new era of stitching together for-profit, non-profit, and government together? So I, I say absolutely. The, a lot of times a program doesn't get off the ground because it doesn't have the, the funding, right? So somebody mm -hmm. comes up with a new idea at a nonprofit and, the, and they can't launch it because they don't have the resources. That's where local philanthropy is, is, is critical, right? And then if we can build evidence around that, uh, then, then you can make an argument that, that there could be broader support for it financially. So let me give you an example. Uh, one of the projects we've worked on is uh, a comprehensive coaching and mentoring program for community college students to, so that they can stay in school and actually cross the finish line and obtain, and obtain an associate's degree in an environment where uh, we, we did this in, in Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, what is it called? Uh, for, uh, stay the course. Stay the course. And, and uh, you know, fewer than one in 10 full-time, first-time enrollees in community college were actually graduating. And so we're pouring all these resources into these students and they're not crossing the finish line. And we ran a, a, an evaluation of this comprehensive coaching and mentoring program that helped students along the way to address the obstacles that, that set them off course and showed that it significantly increased graduation rates, particularly uh, for females. Uh, that was originally supported by, by local and private philanthropy. Uh, the community got interested in this program because uh, it was good policy for the community college. Community college was investing in resources using tax dollars for other programs that weren't cr helping people cross the finish line. And so they've changed their policies to, uh, to, so that they're using the resources to support programs like Stay the Course uh, as opposed to other programs that, that, that haven't been shown to be effective. At the same time, we're now, because of that evidence, we're now replicating <clears throat> in three communities across the country. So uh, let me, I want to go back to my earlier question. <clears throat> I remember uh, in the late 90s, both parties, uh, we, we were really, it was a crackdown on crime. It was, it was three strikes, you're out. Uh, Bill Clinton campaigned on these things. So you basically had a, a bipartisan movement on, on, on criminalizing a lot of things. And we overreached, frankly. But the politics of, of changing that stance were very, very difficult. And it wasn't until probably a decade or so had passed and we started seeing actual evidence from mostly from states that were showing that we just we were missing the mark. You know, drug courts were better than throwing somebody in jail for 10 years for 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 some kind of a nonviolent crime. And can you imagine the politics of of voting against being tough on crime, mm -hmm. whether you're Republican or Democrat? Mm -hmm. So it was sort of amazing. I mean, I changed my own positions from just watching this and reading about this. But to be able to not just change your position just by, by, by being convinced you know, intellectually that this was the wrong course and that's the right course, but politically to get yourself there was really no small feat. And we passed criminal justice reform this last session. I mean, it took us a couple of years to make the effort work, but it was hugely bipartisan when we got it done. 
So I saw that as a, in an amazing example in a very polarizing political time where we actually saw that what we had done wasn't working, there was a better way. That better way was politically precarious and we ended up moving the politics in such a way that it became kind of no-brainer. It became sort of easy to do at the end. What is the next lift like that? Where, where do you think that, that, that data and evidence is gonna take us? I, one of the reasons why I got so enamored with this idea I tried changing the, the way the disability program worked to have a benefit offset formula to encourage people on disa disability to be able to go to work without you know, having a cliff. Because these benefit cliffs are just has, massive marginal income tax rates against upward mobility. And, and we ran into ideological, philosophical, partisan walls. And so again, I, I, I really believe that this data and evidence, as a conservative, I think that, that a lot of the principles I believe in will be vindicated and, and advanced with this. What is the next big reform coming, you think, like criminal justice reform? Ron and then Nick. Yeah, I think the, where we need it the most is in the general area of families. That's where we made, I think, very little progress. There have been some minor prior, progress, but we still have a huge number of kids born outside marriage. You still have a huge number of kids uh, who are reared in single parent families. Um, and that gives a disadvantage both to the adult in those families and to the kids. So I don't know exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, I think work is gonna be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Child care is gonna be a part of it. There's still a lot of work to do to figure it out and we'll need good research to do it. But that's the area where I think we need the most progress. Nick. So just thinking about your example of criminal justice reform in the full package that worked its way through Congress was something called the Second Chance Act. Yeah. And there had actually been a really good evaluation of Second Chance that had been completed that didn't right. have the most glowing results for the program. Mm -hmm. But I thought one of the really interesting things that happened was that Congress took the results of that evaluation, recognizing that it wasn't you know, a perfect program, and tried to figure out how to make some modifications and improve it over time. So Second Chance was reauthorized as part of the criminal justice reforms, and it continues, even though the program evaluation didn't have the most favorable results. So I think that's actually the tea leave for suggesting what's going to happen next and where the priorities go. Um, and much of this is a credit to the Evidence Act being a law that covers across the board government agencies. So yeah. it's not just about families or just about one uh, sector of government, but really every agency ha now has some expectations to improve their data infrastructure so we actually use the data for understanding outcomes across the board. Um, honestly, I think the biggest gains because of that that we'll see will be in agencies that are beyond the traditional health, education, welfare mm -hmm. department agencies. So. Uh, instead of it uh, being exclusively a conversation around HHS education or even SSA, we'll start to see these same concepts applied in other agencies where we haven't traditionally seen a lot of evaluation. And I think that's really exciting. Um, you know, maybe in the Department of Commerce, uh, the application of uh, program evaluation to things that NOAA is working on, yeah. the National Oceanic and Admin Atmospheric Administration, can generate brave new insights for talking about everything from weather to uh, the small grant programs that they operate. Um, the Small Business Administration, better doing evaluation, stands to improve businesses across the country. Um, <clears throat> part of the Evidence Act requires agencies to establish this learning agenda mm -hmm. and uh, basically articulate the big questions that they have that they would like help answering uh, to inform policies going forward. The Small Business Administration actually did that before the Evidence Act required it. They put one out after the commission recommended it, but before the Evidence Act became law. On um, what, 7A or? Um, across the board. They call oh, it their yeah. Enterprise Learning Agenda. And one of the really fascinating things about SBA doing this was when they released it, they started getting questions from researchers asking about how they access data mm -hmm. to answer the questions the SBA has. And that's exactly what learning agendas should be driving across the entire federal government. And so if this is all successful and the work of agencies to implement the Evidence Act happens with that spirit and that culture and the kind of enthusiasm around continuous learning and improvement, uh, much reflected in this example of the Second Chance Act and taking the evaluation results and trying to figure out how you make a positive change to the program to drive the outcomes that you want. If we can experience that across government, this is going to be a sea change. Yeah, and one of the areas I think it's going to be is in homelessness. You've got a big homeless problem in, in certain cities, and, uh, and 
it's sort of an ideological fight at the moment, but I think we can get get past that and, and actually make a big difference there. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I was going to say homelessness, <coughs> and oh, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, you <laughs> took my job on you. But but Please. if you so uh, a lot of the work we do is inspired by the local providers, and so we talked to them and said, what are you working on? What are the big big challenges you're facing in your community? And certainly, if you're talking to San Francisco, L.A., yeah. Seattle, um, that is not the first thing they mentioned. It's almost everything that yeah. they mentioned, and. Uh, it, there, I think it's a good example of a policy area where evidence has played a, a really strong role too. The, um, so we, from a recent study that we did at Leo, um, we know that HUD VASH vouchers, yep. so these are vouchers uh, for, for veteran, uh, homeless veterans to, to put them in permanent supportive housing, um, have had a significant impact on reducing vet veterans' homelessness. Uh, the, there, <clears throat> so much of what the local policy is is driven by federal funding so uh, there's federal funding for housing subsidies. That's going to drive their provision at the local level of subsidies. Uh, a lot of, uh, of emphasis was put on uh, the rapid rehousing program. Uh, and so communities are offering uh, rapid rehousing. The, the, uh, much of the funding for emergency financial assistance to prevent homelessness comes, comes from federal funding. And we're just now starting to test these programs. Uh, the family, family option study was a, a, real, a great <coughs> randomized controlled trial study that, 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 uh, ran, uh, that HUD initiated uh, to test the effects of, of, of rapid rehousing versus housing subsidies and other things. And in that particular example, the housing subsidies won out. So they mm -hmm. looked out that they, have, they had a bigger, uh, a bigger impact on preventing homelessness than, uh, than rapid rehousing. Uh, but we're just now starting to test this for different groups and for, for in different communities to really understand where should we put these scarce dollars yeah. to, to make an impact. Because you know, if you ask uh, anybody interested in social policy in LA or San Francisco, uh, what they care about is yep. going to be, how, what can we do to make a difference in homelessness? Yeah. I agree. I agree. Let me open it up to the audience. Uh, anybody have any questions for, for the people and the panelists? Yeah. Um, uh, Tell us who you are. Oh, Jason in, Turner, Secretary of Innovation Group. Oh, yeah. Uh, Association of State Human Services yeah. Workforce. Nice right. to see you again. So what yeah. we do is take evidence. Or Wait, hang on. There's a mic coming around. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. So what we try and do is take evidence of what works, both practic from practical and from uh, research, and apply it uh, to create policy at the state level. That's our, that's our mission. Now, here's my uh, question for the panel. Um, sometimes, like Ron says, there's uh, an impact, but it's so minor that it becomes, you need to have big impacts in order for policy to change. Here's an example of a big impact scientific evidence and no use of the information to create policy. I'm referring to the Surgeon General Jerome Adams' recent advisory on marijuana in which he says, the scientific evidence shows the teen's use uh, of marijuana increases opioid abuse, creates uh, uh, disorders such as schizophrenia, negatively affects attention, memory, decision making, motivation, impairs learning, declines in IQ and school performance, um, and uh, reduces social achievements and life satisfaction. <laughs> Hello? No one's using this information because when I talk to my state secretaries, they say there's, the information only comes from the pro-marijuana industry. So my question to the panel is, what's your theory as to why that is in this instance, and more generally, where there's solid scientific evidence, it doesn't get properly used. Let me just, let's just start with Ron and come down. And let okay. me just say, I have a different position than the other former Speaker of the House on this particular <laughs> issue. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'll make one point and leave plenty of room for other people to make other points. Uh, there are always examples like this. There are always examples where the politics is too difficult, and usually it's because uh, big business is involved and it's very difficult to overcome them. Look how long it took us to get a grip uh, on the issue of, of, uh, of other drugs, uh, and we still don't have a firm grip on them. And it's because of the power on the other side to offset <coughs> messages, uh, to lobby in legislatures. So that's part of the reason, I think, uh, that that message has not uh, uh, gained hold. One other little footnote here is, that for years we did get a message that, oh, 
all this stuff about marijuana being bad for you was wrong. And marijuana is good. It's fun to take it. Mm -hmm. People have a good time. So marijuana is good. I want you to know I haven't taken any marijuana since I read that report. So that's <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, in, interpreting evidence in any context is always complicated. I mean, there's a lot of different inputs that come in from a variety of places. Uh, you know, there's this growing uh, uh, part of our field that deals with what's called a systematic review, which is taking uh, a lot of studies that have been produced and trying to interpret them and understand what the entire body of evidence is suggesting as opposed to what single, a single study is concluding. Um, I, you know, in the marijuana example, I don't, I don't have a brilliant response that specifically answers this other than uh, I, I think outside of that context and basically every policy area that we're going to be dealing with using evidence in the real world, uh, this is going to be complicated. It's going to be hard. There are places where things are probably going to be wrong. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we want to be able to make producing evidence as easy as possible so that when we get something wrong, we can rapidly learn and mm -hmm. improve, and that there's a conversation that's happening about what the evidence means. And policymakers, decision makers in the private sector can take that information and make as good of decisions as possible. We'll make, if I can push back, the Surgeon General is the person who's supposed to take all of the evidence rationalize it and produce an understand, and he did it. And it's irrefutable, it's huge, but it's not being, but it's not being acted on. I think it's responsibility of all of us, and I include myself as an association executive state secretaries, <coughs> to make this uh, a much more prominent part of the federal, the conversation. We're adding a third legalized drug to cigarettes and alcohol, and we're not, we're not discussing it. It's a, it's a scandal. So uh, if I can chime in, the, uh, for, this is a, a really important point in this, in this broader conversation. It's kind of, the, I think, the third step in the process. We, first, we have, to, we have to get the data available to measure these things and that the Evidence Act is, is helping make that possible. Then we actually have to use the data to generate rigorous evidence, right, which, which is really important. And we just can't stop there. And this is the point that we're making. Like, what good is the evidence if people aren't actually going to, to act on it? Mm -hmm. um, there are many examples, not just the Surgeon General one. And, and, and all of the ones that I would give you are in Ron's book, Show Me the Evidence. You, you, go, you go through a lot of these examples where the, the actually the evidence isn't, isn't necessarily uh, shaping your minds. But, but I, I wouldn't take a, a futile perspective as a result, that what good is the evidence if nobody's going to act on it? We just have to acknowledge that it's not enough. And there have to, there, you know, people have to be doing what you're doing, which is taking that evidence and, and disseminating it to policymakers. Um, at at Leo, we're we're working on the same problem with social service providers. So they, we generate evidence on a program. If we show that it doesn't work, it's really hard yeah. to get other service providers to stop doing what they're doing. And if we show that a program does work, it's also hard to get others to to, to move from what they're doing towards that. But, uh, but we have seen successes, and what I, the reason why I think there's such, it's such a big challenge right now is it's a complete culture change. Yes, right. That that's just in the, in, the, in the social services, and I think in the policy world as, as policymakers as well, you just, evidence hasn't been what has been the, the driving factor. Um, but the more we see that happening, the, the more likely it's, we're going to be successful in it driving decisions. Can I add something very quickly to that? Yeah. Uh, I do think smoking is a great example of your point here that I can remember 35 years ago or whatever it was when the Surgeon General reported that smoking was going to kill you uh, and everybody yawned. But gradually it caught on and pretty soon everybody was against smoking, mm -hmm. especially for kids. And smoking has declined. It's declined especially among kids. So. Stay alive and be patient. Just, I guarantee you. Uh, I guarantee you. Five years. Ten, yeah. ten years from now, it'll be better. Twenty years, it'll be better because people are going to pay attention to stuff like that. And it's up to you and us to to be a microphone for for the message. Guy in the back. You put your hand up. They'll bring a mic to you. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Josh Protus. I'm with Mazona Jewish Response to Hunger. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, you uh, mentioned the term uh, rigorous evidence, and I was glad to hear that. Um, sometimes both sides of an issue use evidence that isn't rigorous. And so I want to know um, 
the responsibility of policymakers, of think tanks, to call out from our own side when there's evidence being used that's not rigorously done, that's not randomized control, uh, but it's being used just to support an argument. Um, and, and then one other point, um, just want to ask about the importance of diverse perspectives in those who are asking questions of the data and are looking at issues. I note that it's a panel of all white men. Um, how important is it to have diverse perspectives in the process of analyzing data? Well, let me first say I think your, 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 your upfront point's right on target. Um, as a policymaker, <clears throat> You just don't know what to believe because sometimes when you get all these this evidence coming at you from certain groups, and a lot of it is sort of biased, cooked data, just to reinforce some kind of a bias. And so, as policymakers, you're always sort of you know you think twice before you read uh, what you're what's being presented to you because people can just sort of cook books to make their, their their preconceived notion you know advance a little bit farther. That's one of the reasons why I think going down the field of advancing evidence with, with the kind of rigorous data that we're talking about, the rigorous procedures will help us get rid of that sort of confirmation bias that is so obvious. It's, there's no panacea here, and it's, there's always going to be confirmation bias, but I think we can get ourselves to another level whereby um, we, can, we can more easily dispel stuff that is clearly slanted and biased. But let me, let me turn to you guys. Yeah, on the... Tiers of evidence point is, is a really important one here that I'm, that I'm glad you brought up uh, because the data alone can, can be a weapon, right? People can use access to this data to, to spin things to tell a story that, that supports uh, their argument. And, um, you know, the single best way to combat that is to uh, reward more rigorous uh, evidence. So the more rigorous is the evidence, the, the more persuasive should be the argument, and if policymakers, foundation leaders, benefactors are responding to the quality of the evidence, um, then that's going to crowd out the, the, the bad evidence. And there's lots of good examples of this. I know it, it's, there's, there's lots of counterexamples too, but even in the, the Department of Ed and, and the uh, IES, the Institute for Educational Sciences, they reward funding based on the quality of evidence. So the higher the quality of evidence on the effectiveness of that intervention, the more likely you are uh, to get funding, the higher points that that, that proposal receives. And we just need that to be the way that we allocate funds in, in across a whole swath mm -hmm. of social policy, not just, not just in terms of grants to evaluate uh, or, or expand uh, education programs. Nick. So I, I think we have to be cautious here about uh, assuming that rigor necessarily means a particular design, like a randomized control trial. Uh, the gross domestic product is rigorously compiled as a descriptive statistic. Uh, I don't know who in here uses GDP for anything, mm -hmm. right? Like drives markets, unemployment rate. I mean, I could, I could give you a laundry list of descriptive statistics. And the Evidence Act is really about uh, not one particular method, but being able to deploy statistical approaches across a variety of, of areas. So it might be that in some cases we're talking about performance metrics. Uh, in other cases, we might be talking about quasi-experimental designs, and in other cases, we might be doing RCTs. Um, so just a, a general point, I'm not an ideologue about RCTs, but I think they're hugely valuable, and we should do vastly more of them than we do. Um, in practice, uh, decision makers also need good information about the context in which programs are operating, and that's an area where we might need to deploy qualitative methods, do interviews, case studies. Homelessness is a great example, actually, where we've done a lot of really great qualitative research over decades to try to understand uh, um, how programs are actually being implemented in the field. And I say all of that because as we talk more about deploying rigorous methods, what we actually need to be talking about is how we gauge validity, reliability, and credibility of studies. And I teach my graduate students in program evaluation about those three core concepts in anything that they read. And they are basically charged with taking every program evaluation that they can find and they just tear it apart based on credibility, validity, and reliability. Uh, the reality is there's, there's no perfect study out there. Um, but we are constantly charged with trying to figure out where the gaps in knowledge are and how to apply the pieces that we have for as much good as we can. 
And in order to do that, we need good trusted intermediaries. Uh, think tanks in DC play this really critical role of trying to understand what evaluations mean. And then maybe they're advocating for some policy change as a consequence. Academics have a huge role to play here. And instead of getting into these bogged down conversations about methods that only academics can understand, helping normal people, policymakers, decision makers actually understand what it is they're talking about at the end of the day. There's a laundry list of things that we could do better as uh, evidence builders, better as evaluators, mm -hmm. better as research methodologists even, in articulating how you gauge credibility at the end of the day, because that's what's really important. There, there are government agencies that do a lot of this and are highly, highly reliable. And they do not base on one study. <clears throat> and they certainly would trash a lousy study. I'm thinking like the Congressional Research Service is one of the finest organizations of that type I've ever encountered. The Congressional Budget Office, same way. Many of the uh, subdivisions within HHS and the other federal agencies, <clears throat> their reviews of the literature are really uh, extremely valuable. So the government is doing a lot of this too. It's encouraging to me. Yeah, and GAO yeah. as well. Yeah, GAO yeah, too, so. yeah. Let me make a, a quick point about your diver diversity of perspectives, because uh, I think one thing that we've learned when working with social service providers at the local level throughout the country is how important it is to get that local perspective that is also often a very diverse perspective depending on what community uh, you're living in. Um, one lesson learned, for example, from, from uh, several studies we've done is you can have a well-intentioned, well-designed program that provides services, so say it's um, some cash assistance and job training, and you offer it to people who are short on cash and don't have a job, and they don't take up services. And the reason is because the program was designed from the top up, not with an understanding with, with the other things going on in that individual's life. So you don't have that diverse perspective of, you know, where are they coming from? And, you know, maybe it's because, well, you know, to come to get that job training, I don't have, I don't have access to public transportation to get there. And there's all these other things. So partnering with the local level and having that understanding of what's going on on the grounds has been critically important. That diverse perspective has been Yeah, and the, the point I was going to make to the diversity point was it, you have to have relatable people to be able to make yeah. these connections. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. You have to have trust yeah. factors. Yes. That's and so that, that's why diversity is extremely important in this, in this particular area. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Caroline Scherger, and I am a science policy fellow at the National Academies. And I'm wondering if you can speak to um, if there's a system in place for a peer review process or um, a consensus of both academic and federal data analysis to make sure that the decisions we're making for policy are truly on the actual science and not just a bias approach. Well, um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, there's actually a really promising effort currently underway across the executive branch called the Federal Data Strategy. Uh, it's, it's not science per se, but it, it gets to the core concepts. Um, so the federal data strategy was um, the executive branches plan to, in part, implement the Evidence Act. Mm. And it includes a set of principles and a set of practices that are intended for every federal agency to be implementing these over the next decade. Uh, just before the holidays, at the end of December, the executive branch released a 2020 action plan that, that outlines 20 steps that agencies will be specifically undertaking. Some of the things that are included in there are specifically to your question uh, around creating ethics frameworks for how we use data, uh, reducing bias. Um, uh, there are um, also these efforts that have uh, been underway over the last year to uh, modify something called the Information Quality Act. Um, there's guidance that came out from OMB mid-year last year that specifically deals with to your question, how we're interpreting the information and maintaining that the information that government decision makers are using is high quality, outlines certain peer review processes that are expected for government research. So I'd say there's a lot happening inside the federal agencies today that specifically gets us to a better position around exactly your question. Actually, that was going to be my last question on the panel. Just keep going on that point, because um, I think you probably want to track someone be the closest on this issue. Um, where, how, how would you judge where, because OMB is obviously the, 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 the enabler, that's the key agency that's going to make all of this work. Uh, have you had a, had a, had a view into the, into the president's upcoming budget um, that is due uh, in February? It's always late, but it's, it's coming soon. Uh, where do you think they are? How would you grade OMB's progress on this issue? And then guys, chime in if you want to. 
So o OMB is making tremendous progress. Uh, I mean, the Evidence Act has a ton of requirements for yeah. federal agencies. Right, Much cool. of that starts with OMB issuing guidance, in some cases regulations. The fact that the federal data strategy even happened <clears throat> is sort of a miracle. Uh, there has been really no point in history where an administration has said, we recognize that better using our data is not something that we're going to fix overnight. It's something that's going to take us a long time to get the right mechanisms and the people and the processes and the procedures in place. So just by saying this 10-year strategy exists, and I don't know if anybody's doing the math in the room, but no president can be in office for more than mm -hmm. 10 years. Uh, you can do the math there. Um, <laughs> so the fact that it is a 10-year plan is really just... It's a, it's a game changer. Um, OMB has started issuing their guidance. Uh, they have a number of documents that are still in draft form. We're expecting draft regulations to come out mm -hmm. soon. So really, 2020 is the year we will see a lot of progress happen around establishing the chief data officers, uh, making sure the evaluation officers across federal agencies have what they need to get the job done. Um, as for the budget, you know, uh, I hope that it will fully endorse and provide resources so that federal agencies can do more evaluation so they can support the chief data officers and actually better govern the data that we're really talking about using better. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, uh, I, I don't have insights uh, mm -hmm. into specifically what it's, gonna, what it's gonna show. I just hope for the best. Okay, I don't have that feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, you, it's not necessarily an optimistic uh, tone to leave on if it's, you know, in 10 years we're going to we're going to have this uh, great uh, structure in place. Um, but I am much more optimistic uh, because as we're waiting for this transition to happen, uh, things are happening much faster at the yeah. local level. So if you look at the state, the state and local level, we're seeing uh, counties in particular are building data infrastructure to be able to share data across many different agencies. Uh, so I, I think of uh, Santa Clara County and, uh, and King County are good examples where you know, the criminal justice and, and the, um, the health systems and the employment agencies are all sharing data. And, uh, and what, what, what the evidence, evidence acts in part is, is uh, catalyzing that because it's, it has uh, launched this culture of, of a yes and less, right? So you say yes to sharing data unless there's a, a real reason why we yeah. can't do it. Yeah. And we're already seeing Those that. Those exact and words are in this, the report. This is, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, they're, they're in the report. And, and, and what I'm seeing at the local level is that, that that impact's already happening. So it's not that we have to wait 10 years mm -hmm. for the, the real impact of this, of this act. It's because of that, of that culture. And people see it coming down down the pipeline on the horizon. Yeah. Um, we're we're already seeing progress at the local right. level. I'd like to make two points. Uh, one is uh, concerning this whole conversation, the role of local governments has been a little bit minimized. I mean, I, I just you can't overemphasize the importance yeah. of local governments. It has to happen at the local level, or it didn't happen. Uh, and the role of state governments and the role of state and local governments working together. That is really crucial. That's why I'm so glad you were on the panel because you told several stories about how this can really make a difference. And uh, often folks like us here in Washington thinking about OMB and you know, HHS and so forth don't realize the flexibility and the power that the states have at the state level and the local level. So that's really important. And I think you're right. I think a lot is going on. Look at the publications of results first, uh, and also um, results for America. And there are several other organizations that are doing excellent work at the state and local level. Um, so I think that's really that's an important uh, thing to emphasize. As for OMB, I, I completely agree with Nick. He knows a lot more than I do about it. But OMB, at least in the last year, and I don't know how much of this is at the top leadership level or where exactly it comes from, but there are forces there at OMB that are saying, yes, we're going to push this forward, we're going to work with the agencies, and we're going to make data much more important than it's been in the past. So I think OMB is really on the right path, and they are providing leadership uh, for the federal agencies, and we're going to continue to make great progress as long as OMB can continue to do that. That's what I've heard as well, so I'm glad you basically confirmed um, a, a decent sense of optimism there. Other questions? Oh, the lady in the back and then the guy in the front. How does that sound? Oh, oh well, okay, we'll reverse it. Okay. Wait. He uh, jumped at you first. He didn't see it, but you're, you're next. Yeah. Go ahead, okay. sir. Go ahead. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Fred Altman. I'm retired, so I get a chance to come to these meetings. Um, my uh, question is, it seems to get the population to appreciate the uh, uh, importance of evidence is an important, if you're going to make this work in the long run, to get the support. And we have a society in which a lot of people still be believe in psychics, so how can we get somewhere? <laughs> Anybody want to take a stab at that? <laughs> well, maybe maybe not the psychic part, but yeah, um, I, was say. <laughs> <laughs> I I think the the short answer here is we have to be able to demonstrate the value of this entire endeavor, yeah. and the American public has to be able to see the benefits yeah. of the investments that we're making in everything from data infrastructure to actually doing evaluations. And if we don't see results manifest in how our policies are structured and being implemented, then maybe they should be questioning what we're doing. Uh, because we're spending a lot of money to, to do this work. And so I think it's really incumbent on uh, those of us that are in the evidence building community, those who are in Congress or in federal agencies, to be <clears throat> using this information, but also be good stewards of explaining how they're using the evidence that they're receiving in a meaningful and productive way. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me take a stab at that real fast. <clears throat> the way I see it as a policymaker is uh, sometimes you have preconceived notions on what's right, what's not. and Sometimes they, they aren't correct. And, and you have to have an open mind to uh, look at real evidence and change your opinion as to what makes a difference, what works. Criminal justice reform is a really good example of that. Uh, the McPhee program, I always thought it was an odd thing back in the day to keep sending all these people into the homes. And, 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 and we understood it make a huge difference. So I think you have to have policymakers that have an open mind to looking at evidence and responding to it. But more importantly, I think that, that, that the, the, we're going into it in the 21st century. Data is going to be all consuming. Data is going to be everywhere. So the question really isn't whether we're going to be a data based society. The question is are we getting ahead of it? Are we going to make sure that we take proactive measures to guarantee our privacy and to make sure that data goes where you want it to go, to whom you want it to go? That's what this was all about. And it will help you better hone your, measurement, your measurements to make sure that, 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 that the things you're doing, the taxpayer dollars you're spending, are actually going toward their intended benefit. Government, this is what I always say to people on my side, to conservatives, government's going to do this. Government's going to be involved in this space. Government's going to be um, fighting the war on poverty forever. Uh, we, will, we will always be doing these programs, so why don't we make sure that it's really effective? Oh, and let's try and shrink um, the size of the poor as best we can. And I think those practical arguments are, are buttressed with good data, and it will help us make sure that we get ahead of these things. So I, I just think that it helps you leapfrog what are stubborn, ideological, polarized, fixed positions, get through them, and actually make a good difference at the end of the day. We've done it episodically. Now I think we have a chance to do it really wholesale. Uh, yeah, the lady in the back. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your comments. Um, so I represent a program within the Aspen Institute. Um, it's called the Ascend Program, where the we what focus program? the Ascend Program, where we really focus on a two, the two generation approach, whole family approach to creating upward economic mobility for families. And so one of the key components of that is ensuring that you are uh, measuring and accounting for outcomes for both children and the adults in their lives. Um, prior to joining this team, I spent eight years in state government in Tennessee. See, and I can attest that it is very difficult for states to be able to, to do this intentionally. We know that it's the right thing to do and the way to go, um, but because of legacy systems and real and perceived barriers in terms of sharing data, funding, you know, it's really difficult for states. And so I guess my question is around the CIPRA um, bit that came out last year um, from the Department of Treasury. It was a very, um, it required an RCT, and it was only available to state and local governments. But we also know a lot of innovation happens at the community level. So I guess, what are your thoughts around um, how some of this funding is, uh, is provided to states and localities, um, the flexibility around the types of evaluations that are performed, and then also any guidance that you can give states as to um, how they approach their data collection um, so that we're making sure we're taking that comprehensive approach to service and also tracking um, outcomes intentionally. 
Well, Jim. I guess since I served on the SIPR Commission, yeah, you, want, you want me to answer this. Uh, uh, so uh, for those that aren't familiar with uh, this, the Social Impact Partnership to Pay for Results Act, uh, it provides funding to seed these uh, social impact interventions where um, a third party pays for, so think of a philanthropist pays for an intervention like permanent supportive housing, uh, and then we track the outcomes of the intervention. And if there actually are results like savings to the federal government on, say, the reduced use of Medicaid payments, then the federal government, in this case the Treasury, would, make a pay, would pay that third party back for those results. So that's the pay for results component of it. Um, they actually, uh, the language in the law, which I, I liked, was re really pushed for rigorous evidence generation. There wasn't a strict requirement for randomized controlled trials, and in fact, Many of the proposals that were, viewed, were, were um, uh, evaluated quite favorably were, were not randomized controlled trials, although those, the better the evidence, kind of the, the, the more favor it got. Um, there, so you point out an interesting challenge. So, well, first, let's talk about th this is a great opportunity to provide funding for programs like dual gen programs that may struggle to get funding otherwise, right? So let's seed projects. And then I like that it's a real emphasis on results, right? Mm -hmm. So we want the programs that can sh get results to actually be rewarded. So, it's, so, so the model has, has lots of promise. But you point out like a key problem here. Um, and I think, and th we've talked a lot about this in conversations uh, about, about how SIPRA might look in the future. Um, is that oftentimes the cost savings is not to the federal government, right? The cost savings might be to the local community. So you, you provide a dual gen uh, model. Now there's less uh, need for invest, your cost savings uh, in terms of interventions for kids because it's, it's, it's improving outcomes for, for children. That's saving money for the local community that doesn't necessarily tri trickle up to directly to the federal government. So there isn't, therefore, that cost savings to be, to be uh, um, pay, reimbursed. They call it the, the wrong pockets problem in, in, in the social impact bond space. And, and th there's a way, to, the way to address this, right? So if, if the federal government were willing to just pay for outcomes, whether or not it mm -hmm. saved them money, right? So suppose the federal government said, what we care about is uh, that kids graduate high school in this dual gen program that might be an outcome that, 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 that you care about, and we will pay for kids to graduate high school, even though it's going to be really hard to measure the immediate return on that investment for the federal government. We project that over the long run, that means higher earnings, higher tax dollars. Uh, it's going to save the federal government money in the, in the long run. We're not going to be able to measure it in, 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 the, in the short run, but we're going to pay for it anyway. And um, you know, countries in Europe are already doing this. The UK is, is, yeah. is leading in that, in that kind of model. I think there's a, a, a lot of promise in it. Yeah, I would say that we got this idea from, from the Brits, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, Ted. When we put this in the tax bill, um, uh, I forgot the name of Ian Duncan Smith's think tank, Center for Social Justice. They've done a lot of work on this. Uh, IDS is a Tory politician in Britain mm -hmm. who um, uh, was the, the party leader before Cameron, I believe. And uh, he, he's, he's done a lot of work on this. You got to take a look at their Center for Social Justice, it's called. Yeah, they've done a lot of work on this stuff. Thank you for that. Can I just ask one follow-up question? So what guidance do you have for states in terms of real and perceived barriers? Because there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of apprehension um, within state government to be able to share data across different agencies, be that human services, health, corrections, education. There's just a... Um, um, a lot of apprehension around what is actually allowed to be shared, um, and then like longitudinal data systems and like how those can actually really help to propel a lot of these innovations forward. Thank you. Get over it. It's the wave <laughs> of the future. Uh, you got to share data, and many states are doing it, and they're figuring out ways to do it and still protect their access to the data. Um, as I mentioned before, a results first, uh, supported by Pew and MacArthur, has done a lot of work in this area. Um, results for America is doing the same thing. So there are a lot of states that are sharing data across agencies. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Results for America emphasizes that as one of the areas uh, that they think is very important for the states to do a better job of sharing data, not just the states, but with local government too. And I, it doesn't always answer the question, but, but one persuasive argument would be when they say you, this can't be done, you say, yes, it can. And here's the, here, here are the examples. 
And I would, I would go to the state of Indiana. Indiana uh, launched an uh, initiative by the state of Indiana. It's called MPH, and I'm, uh, I'm escaping me what that stands for. But this, th it is uh, part of the state government, and they collect all the state, the, the, the administrative data from across the state. They consolidate it all, and they uh, determine who can get access to it to help measure things. So, they, so it's a, essentially a one-stop shop now for administrative data in the state of Indiana. And we're just now figuring out how we're mm -hmm. going to use it. But it can be done. Uh, but oftentimes, it's, it, there's, a, there's a bit of uh, effort that has to go into it, um, but maybe pointing to some successes will help. Well, and just building on this, uh, I mean, there, it's really imperative that states deploy good transparency mechanisms as they're undertaking this work. They can't hide from the public what's, mm -hmm. what's happening. Um, but as Ron said, they've just got to start doing it. Uh, one of the values of a national secure data service at the federal level is it would actually enable us to help states do some data sharing mm -hmm. and privacy protective data linkages. So it's even more imperative that we get this conversation going around a data service because it also has huge benefits for states. In the interim, they just got to get going. Uh, last question, woman in the back, did you have your hand up or no? No? Oh, okay, go ahead, this lady over here. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the point Introduce about- Introduce yourself. <laughs> Come on. Um, I'm Deborah Williams, formerly at Ways and Means, Best not Canadian Pfizer. Congress. That's right. Um, we've been looking at social determinants of health um, and it's part of our contribution to society. And you mentioned programs that don't work. And one of the things I've been kind of confounded by, Cam, there's something called the Camden study, which just finished. They did an extensive sort of um, social services, outreach, you know, everything was soups to nuts for the high flyers and their ERs and admissions and um, the people who are really costly, uh, the top 1% of, of expenses who, um, uh, you know, had certain economic and other barriers. But unfortunately, MIT did the evaluation, and unfortunately it was all, as it typically is in medical studies, it's all regression to the mean. Their admissions went down, but so did everybody else's. So is that, you could talk a little bit about, you know, what can we learn from failure? Should we keep funding failures because we think they're good things? We should declare war against regression to the mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a really good slogan right there. I like that a lot. That's good. Well, I, I think we can learn a lot from failures, and I, I think the trick is to actually use the failure as an opportunity to improve. I gave the example of the Second Chance Act earlier, where the impacts that were revealed in a fairly rigorous randomized control trial were not what anyone expected. They weren't as uh, promising as we might have hoped, but that also informs how we can change the design of a program. Right. So just because the results of an evaluation suggest that something's not working, that doesn't necessarily mean we immediately cut funding for it. It might mean that actually the reason it didn't work is because it didn't have enough funding. And so uh, there are a lot of different ways to interpret an evaluation result in a policy context. What do you do with these results once you have them? And honestly, as all of this work goes forward and we start having more evaluations that policymakers are debating how to implement in a policy context, we're going to see a lot more of this discourse about what it really means to actually use evaluation. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the best ways to just kill all the progress we made would be to treat every evaluation as a high stakes, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, decision because nobody would want to do it, right? They're not going to want to put themselves under a microscope. Uh, the, the example you gave is one of many interventions now that, that broadly might be called freak, frequent utilizer interventions, where you, you just focus the services on those that are you know, interacting with the criminal justice system a lot or, or with, the, with the healthcare system a lot. And at Leo, we have three or four of those evaluations going on right now. We didn't shut down those evaluations because, because of the, the less than promising results from, from Camden. Um, but it helps us think about it. So what, based on, we have some promising results in some of these interventions. What is it about our study that's different than theirs? Is it a different population? Is it a different social service network? And, and each of these contributes to the body of evidence. If all of them come in, in, in these studies, and, the, and we, again and again we say, well, we can't do anything for these frequent utilizers, I think that should steer resources in a different direction. Uh, but right now, it's just one study contributing to a, to a broader body of evidence. Let me, um, let me say, that one of the reasons, so, so Jimmy's dad, Jack, was my mentor in this space. I spent years running around the country with Jack Kemp when I was a young guy, and then more recently with people like Bob Woodson. 
Uh, and uh, the reason I founded the American Idea Foundation, which is my foundation focused on poverty, um, is to try and make that connection um, at the grassroots level where you have poverty fighting entrepreneurs at the grassroots level who have great ideas and great theories on how to move the needle. They have incredible credibility uh, in their communities, but they don't have quite the resources they need or the academically proved rigorous you know, RCTs and whatnot to really build programs that can scale and be replicated. That to me is, is the next wave where um, that's again what we're doing at the American Idea For Foundation is not everybody knows each other. It's, it's to the gentleman, to his point earlier, which is you've got really sincere, authentic, effective grassroots poverty fighters, great need, policy entrepreneurship that you want to encourage. You don't want to stultify and sterilize policy entrepreneurship. But you also have this great academic, um, rigorous uh, new field that can show you how to really make a difference. Um, don't waste time going down rabbit holes that have already been you know, proven not to work. And all this private sector philanthropy that's out there looking to make a difference, but not necessarily knowing where to send the money. So the connections that need to be made here are with the grassroots poverty entrepreneurs, the academics who have spent a lot of time testing theories and evaluating data, and um, not just the public dollars, but all that private philanthropy dollars that are out there that have all basically swished around the country in a haphazard way, not really in, in, in moving a, a coherent theory or strategy. I really think what the Evidence Act does is it helps make those connections stick. And it helps combine the forces so that it's not just a government responsibility, it's a societal responsibility to really go at root causes of poverty to make a big difference so that we, at the end of the day, aren't measuring success in the war on poverty and the fight on poverty based on effort, but based on actual evidence and outcome. So we move the needle on poverty. And that is where I am really optimistic and excited because I think we now have these new tools to make a big difference and more importantly, make the connections that haven't been but will, will be further made in society to make a huge difference. Please join me in welcoming, uh, in welcoming, and in, in thanking, and thanking, uh, welcoming you all to the fight. These guys have been doing this for a long time, and thanking Ron Haskins, Nick Hart, and Jim Sullivan uh, for all your work and for participating in today's panel. Thank you very Thank much, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys.